Welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian, Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, and me, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker. Our guest today is André Narbonne, a marine engineer by first trade. André Narbonne was living out of his duffel bag when he arrived in Halifax on a damaged tanker in the mid-80s. He completed two degrees in English at Dalhousie University, where he was a Killam scholar and his PhD in Canadian literature at the University of Western Ontario. He is a former chair of the Halifax chapter of the Canadian Poetry Association. His short stories have won the Atlantic Writing Competition, the Free Fall Prose Contest, and the David Adams Richards Prize, and were anthologized in Best Canadian Stories. He teaches English and creative writing at the University of Windsor and is the fiction editor of the Windsor Review. His latest book, Lucienne and Olivia, was long listed for the 2022 Scotiabank Giller Prize. Welcome, Andre. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, congratulations on the success of, of this book. Um, a long listing for the Griller Prize is no small thing. Your main character is a marine engineer. And although he is well read, he has trouble writing down what he wants to say while he's working on board ship. Were you able to write while you were on your working days on board ship? I used to write eight to 12 page letters. Uh, I was very much into letter writing because it was the 80s and that that's, was the best way to communicate. Uh, and uh, there was no cell phone, on, no cell phone, no way of talking on the phone. So I, I would write really long letters, just like the Victorians did. Did you find that was like writing laterally? Did your letters inspire any other kind of writing or was it just all about the letters and the sharing of thoughts? Well, here's the story. Uh, one of the stories that I uh, did quite well with uh, that was anthologized in Best Canadian Stories is about something that happened to me. It happened on a ship. I was on a tanker. We were trying to get into Corner Brook, but we were icebound. And there was an icebreaker ahead of us, and it was stuck in the ice, too. And the after three days, uh, one of the people on the icebreaker committed suicide. And he did this because his wife had told him, or his girlfriend, sorry, had told him that she was going to leave him. And he kept saying to her, and you could hear on the ship to shore, he kept saying to her, wait till I get home. And she kept saying, why wait? Why wait? And this is a tr- true story, I believe. And uh, so I had written this in a letter to my friend Kathleen McConnell, a very good friend of mine, and I used to write her very long letters. And after some some time when I was at Dalhousie, I wrote it down. I wrote it down rather feverishly. I had I kind of dreamt the letter and I wrote it in three nights. Uh, this is very strange for me. It's not really the way I work, but I had this dream in which everything in the letter was happening. And so I write it and, and the beginning of it knows the end, which is really quite surprising because I wrote it in three days in three distinct parts, all of them of equal length. So that won a number of contests. It was published in the Anaganish Review. It won the Atlantic Writing Contest, one of the best Canadian stories. And I, and I got in touch with Kathy. I said, that letter I sent you, uh, if I were you, I'd keep that. <laughs> Who knows? It might mean something someday. And she got back in touch with me and she said, I've kept every letter you wrote to me. Uh, that one does not exist. That's wild. Wow. <laughs> Well, speaking of the transition from letter writing into other types of writing, what kind of writing formats did you use to learn to become a, an author? What, what did you work on first? Was it always prose? Well, I, uh, this goes back a long way. So I tried to write my first novel in grade three. You know, I was always a reader and, and I was always engaged in conversation with the writers. I always felt that way as a child. And I come from a family of readers and I'm the youngest of six. So all these books passed to me and, and we discussed books all the time. And that's really where my writing comes from is from my siblings, from my conversations with them, from imagined conversations with the writers. Um, and uh, so I started writing prose. And then when I was in high school, I, I had a very lucky thing happened. My teacher 
uh, was Peter Baltensburg. He had a press called Moonstone Press. He published people at Penn Camp. In fact, he brought her into the classroom. And one day he gave us Wayman in Love by Tom Wayman. And when I read that, I thought, holy smokes, you can do that? And another thing that happened was I walked into a store in St. Catharines downtown, where I was in high school. I walked into a store, down, a store downtown and I saw a magazine called Fiddlehead and I bought it and I read it. And it absolutely changed things for me. So I used to spend long hours writing poetry when I was in high school. I didn't think I was weird at all. I didn't know that. I was just writing poetry and I would just, I'd write my lines and I wouldn't change anything. I just changed the length of the line and experiment and see how it sounded, how does the rhythm work with this. So basically I'm self-taught in everything, but I've had really good professors and the writers that I have admired. You've already named a couple of authors that were inspiring to you. Who else had work that inspired your early explorations into writing? Uh, well, I read Melville very early. I read uh, Herman Melville as a child. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, now no, my, my brain is just going, uh, the man who can talk to the animals. <laughs> Dr. Doolittle. Yeah, I read that at a young age. I read, uh, of course, as everyone does, C.S. Lewis. And boy, that's I, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That's what a professor is supposed to be, <laughs> this character. Uh, and uh, the, the, the early stuff was there. Jules Verne, uh, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, I read when I was about nine. And that shows up in my novel because the main character's ideal is to go to Iceland, which he only understands through that book. He doesn't realize that it's the 80s and you can just fly there. He thinks it's this pristine landscape where there's no billboards or anything. And then he, he goes and looks for travel to Iceland. And the first thing he sees is the Reykjavik like holiday inn and he tears up a piece of paper. Yeah. It seems like both of the main characters, Lucy and you just mentioned, have issues with articulating their feelings. With Olivia, even though she's a philosophy student, a trauma interferes with her being able to open up to Lucien. Is this such as much an exercise in expressing town versus gown, everyday workers in connection with students, as this is an unfolding love story? Uh, for example, when Lucien says that all of his friends are on the ship, but doesn't want to introduce them to Olivia. He sees his life as divided, and she's the one who's going to tell him, no, it's not. You're just one person. Uh, the issue that they both have is that they're deep. I wanted to write a story in which uh, the conflict was that the people were basically deep and they were doing these things that, that uh, were hard. His life is really hard on the ship. And I tried to make that as immersive as possible because I've, I've been there, so I can describe it that way. Um, but these are people who are thoughtful, who find value in other people. And that's really their issue. Now, the thing about communication is interesting because I've always thought that, that uh, I was writing about communication. From the earliest thing I, things I wrote, uh, always in my stories, there are people who are talking to each other, but they're not. And that's just a basic trope. And I find that. I look back and I say, oh, well, I was doing this back then. So I, I'm really interested in that, um, in, in whether or not it's really possible to fully communicate with each other. I hope it is. That's a big hope. I yeah. I hope I hope we can all communicate with one another. But sometimes it, you do wonder, right? <laughs> yes. So there's also a lot of humor in the book. There's a hilarious scene in a bar during a blizzard uh, with an open mic night, and Lucian's the only audience member. What was that? Maybe a little comment on poetry readings? I, we're not sure. And also, each character who appears may or may not have a name, such as a bartender in the scene, and he gets to initiate a discussion about art. Um, how did you approach the complexity of including so many characters in a relatively short book? Hmm. Well, I do satirize everything I believe in. I do that as a matter of course. And if you'll notice my feelings about Halifax, the town that I revere, are quite ambivalent. Uh, and so it is with the characters and what they're doing. Uh, there are really bad people who show up at poetry readings and read real stupid poems. Um, and there are, and then there are people who are committed to a sense of audience and they do good work. Uh, so it, it's that way. It's like the open, when the man comes into the bar and starts playing a song, uh, which is based on an actual song that people play a lot in the bars. Uh, 
you know, some people just have no sense of audience. And uh, the book is critical of that. Um, how do I get them? I want everyone to be alive. You know, one of my favorite movies is Roman Holiday. And if you watch this movie, there are no paper thin characters. You know, even the landlord, the taxi driver at the beginning, he's saying, you know, I got to go, Bambino. Uh, they all have something to say, something expressive of some sort of idea of who they are. And I thought if I can do that, even if the characters are, are in some way, well, I don't actually have vice characters, but if they're, they're difficult, if they're troublesome, at least they're talking from something, some perspective, even if it's a perspective of failure, you know, is in the, the bartender artist who's, who's really a failed artist. Uh, or the, the poets who are failed artists, but what the poem that the woman reads, I hope it's hilarious, but it's also, uh, it's also about what the book is about, which is about relations and how dangerous they are and, uh, you know, how, how things can go so bad. Well, what is it about the voices of these characters that impact Lucian in the story? How do those voices affect him? Well, Lucien doesn't always hear things, <laughs> you know, he, he means well. And you see, I, I didn't, I mean, he does mean well. And basically I set his, his character up really early after his uh, uh, affair or tryst uh, with Kathy is that he wants to love in a way be loved or and love in a way that's overwhelming and inevitable. And that is the epic question of the book. Can this happen? So that, that's what's happening. But then there's all these things that are attaching to it that you might not notice. The, it's the study of class, race, uh, women's reproductive rights, all these things are in it. And, uh, and he doesn't always notice what's happening, but there's this firm, honest thread in him that negotiates through all these things. The fact is that despite what he says to Sylvia, I don't know how to be honest. He can say that because he's trying to be honest. On their first date, Olivia and Lucienne read Under the Volcano together, silently. Other books seem to take their place as settings characters as much as references in this work. How did they make their way into this story? Uh, my wife and I, before we got married, used to go for dates in which we would sit in Ottawa and read. <laughs> we would just find a nice place to read. And one of the things I love about my wife is that we can be in the same room and not talk. And still, there's still that sense of love. Um, so the books are there. Notice that she says you read such important books. Under the Volcano is perhaps my favorite book. It would depend on my mood. Uh, great, great book. And so I had them reading it, but this is not a romance book. So two people are romantically just like in love with each other, reading this book about this drunken ambassador who's essentially tottering towards suicide uh, and they're falling in love with each other. So I like the irony of that. I, I tried to do that, you know, the Spock falls in love sort of thing, the sort of thing that's not supposed to happen. It's going to happen um, because it does happen and because it, it produces immediate conflict. I, I want to say this. It, one thing I realized, like, if you notice this in the book, he keeps being called weird. Everyone notices how odd he is. This is the truth of any book. And in this, I'm actually giving writing advice in the book, is that the main character is always the strangest person in the world of the book. Atticus Finch is the strong, strangest person in this town. Nick is the strangest person in The Great Gatsby. The main character is always, and then you have this immediate environmental conflict going on. And you want conflict. So that's what's happening with them. I'm sorry, I think I've gotten a little bit of strike. We were talking about books. Uh, <laughs> there I go. Uh, uh, the books, uh, it's typical. I wanted Kathy to, to say what she said about vampires because I thought that was very funny and very much in character. And everybody was reading Anne Rice back then. Whether in the city of Halifax or on board a ship heading to anywhere, or Olivia talking about Halifax being made of wood and always having to be fixed, or ships that literally have been scrapped. How much of the seeming impermanence of the settings matters to this, this narrative? Well, thank you, it's, it's critical. And you know, when I first arrived in Halifax, I was on a, on a tanker that almost sank. We spent seven months doing repairs and I decided to stay because I really liked it. But what I hated was the architecture. 
all these wooden quadrates. <laughs> Does anybody have an idea? And uh, I know this is like, this is what Olivia says. And Olivia just chastises herself for being so silly as to, you know, take issue with the town. Uh, but then I realized that the beauty of the city for me was that it does keep rebuilding. You have to plank by plank every hundred years, these, these houses replace themselves. And if you walk down Halifax on a spring day, you'll hear people working on the houses. You'll hear that sound, the ripping, shrieking nails. It's one of the sounds of Halifax. I don't know if people notice it. Um, so, and the ships, uh, by the way, every ship I ever sailed on has been scrapped. And before I had stopped sailing, a lot of the ships I'd sailed on had been scrapped because that's just the way it goes. And you catch another ship and you stay afloat. And that's how we do it. So Halifax is always, in a sense, moving in place. It's just regenerating. <laughs> yeah. So that's the beauty of it, I think. You know, that, I mean, downtown now it's it's Tinseltown. And I, I'm not, I was there recently and I'm not angry at it. I mean, a lot of the people there, my friends there, I talk to them, I say, I think that, that the city's done very well for itself. And they're, they're aghast because I'm fairly conservative about these things. I like things to stay pretty. <laughs> and here it is, it's actually catering to the tourist class. Uh, but I think you give that to the downtown core in any city, you give that up, okay? But by and large, Halifax, Halifax has done very well for itself. So what aspects of your writing um, do you feel is important to share with your students at this point in time? I don't sell myself to the students and I don't, Look, I'd rather show them other things. Uh, I know a lot of people do this and they're speaking from their strengths. And when I was writing, I was speaking from my strengths, but I don't teach me. I just feel very awkward about it. Um, if they want to discover it, I'll talk to anyone about it. And, uh, and you know, my students inevitably do find stuff of mine and talk to me about it. But I'd rather teach something by another professor here. And I love teaching Alistair. You know, Alistair would come into the classes and people would line up to sign books and uh, you know I'd rather do that but I do I do okay so don't get me wrong though I mean I teach from the perspective of somebody who reads like a writer I'm always interested in how things are manufactured you know it's, it's a magic show it's, there's tricks going on and how do the tricks work why am I being manipulated what's the point of this what have I not noticed that has actually led me to think about something? And sentimental fiction is by nature political. It gets you to believe in things you wouldn't normally think about. So at the end of my novel, if you want these two people to get together, then you're okay with the fact that there's an abortion. You've accepted that. You've accepted that she's brown and he's white. You've accepted that she's 10 years younger than he is. If you want them to get together, and that's what I was doing. What are you working on now? Uh, well, I have a collection of short stories, which is done, which I'm putting into shape. I'm working on a book, a critical work uh, about a scholar uh, wh whom I admire, uh, Archibald McMacken. and he died in 1933. Uh, not a lot of work has been done on him. That's really my focus right now. But And because this book of short stories is done, I'm just making sure it's the best book I can do. I want every book to be better than the last one. Um, I don't, I don't plump them out. I'm okay with just like, Alice only published three books. It's not like I need to get 60 books out. I just want to get something really good out. Um, and I'm working on a novel as well. I finally got my, my epic question. I knew the characters, I knew scenes of it. And I thought, okay, so what's it about? And I went back to listen to Olivia and the epic questions. Can you be loved that way? So I've got a question. I, got, I came up with that uh, two days ago. So this, the novel's a thing, it's gonna happen. <laughs> but hopefully this one won't take five years. That's great, we'll look forward to it. Uh, would you like to read from some of your work for our listeners? Sure, yeah. Uh, this is true, by the way. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. A cadet on the Sioux River Trader, he spent mornings on watch, looking out the gangway door, seeing the river wake up, the St. Lawrence below Montreal, reeds and fog, lights blinking on one at a time. One dark morning, a dog barked, challenging the trader's passage. You couldn't see the dog, it remained a sound. He tried to memorize the bark, assuming every day had to matter. Later that summer, he heard a second dog. He'd gone to sleep as the ship steamed up the Saguenay in the direction of Tracy, woke up in the larger of two towns sharing a bridge, not Tracy, just somewhere. 
It was noon and he had four hours. He was wandering the downtown, three steeples, one stoplight. Not Tracy was one of those towns where Catholicism or aluminum is the main industry. Trying to find a place to sit where he wouldn't have to talk to anyone. Thinking on a park bench, trying not to be seen, he became aware of trouble. Followed the smell of smoke to the river, saw it thicken and curtain the far shore. Another three steeples stood above the smoke, looking back at the three on his side. He heard later that after the fire, there were only two. A dog barked balefully across the river, unseen, the I am here of an animal. For years, he thought he'd wake up one day in a place he couldn't name, a place with two steeples, and would know the town by its bark. For a decade, he willed the sound to return, aggressive, challenging, above all, familiar. I just want to say, if I could add one thing um, about books and about influence, I couldn't have written this book if I hadn't read Casey Platt's uh, Little Fish. Now, this is not about the same thing at all, but what I really admired about her book was that she didn't explain herself. She just did it. You want to understand this? You try to understand it. I'm not going to explain this. That had such a big influence on me. I thought, okay, now I can write this. I can see how this is done. And the other one was Love Story. What can you say about a 24-year-old girl who died? That she loved Beatles, the Beatles, Beethoven, Bach, and me, but not in that order. So, I mean, Eric Segal in this, this classic 1970s book kills off the main character in the first sentence. And yet, 200 and some pages later, you try and resist it. You try not to cry. <laughs> He's like daring you. And he does it. Yeah. Uh, if I could do that, that's power. Because yeah. if somebody ever read something of mine and told me they cried, I thought, Yeah. <laughs> For sure, and and we'll certainly put a link to Casey Platt's Little Fish in in the show notes for this because it, it is fantastic. It, yeah. it it'll knock you sideways, and and your book is fantastic too. So thank you so much for sharing that with us, thank and you. thank you for your time today. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful to be able to be able to do this. Thank you. have a new segment on our show this season. Occasionally we'll introduce enterprising local authors with some information about them and their books, and perhaps a short reading by them. In this episode, we're sharing a reading by Edmund Gagnon. Brown hung up the phone and heard a commotion in front of the Greektown Hotel. A hysterical woman was being restrained by a uniform cop. The detective walked across the street and under the canopy covering the entrance to the hotel. Eyeing the sobbing female, Abigail assumed she was about to meet the victim's widow. The woman told the detective she and her husband, Joel Humboldt, were staying at the hotel. They fought, and he went for a walk to cool off. Brown led Mrs. Humboldt into the hotel lobby. They went over everything from earlier in the evening. The couple lived in Farmington Hills and decided to stay the night after having dinner and too many drinks. Everything went well until a discussion over her husband's business turned sour. From his physical description and clothing, Detective Brown was sure the victim was Joel Humboldt. When the wife broke down crying again, Abigail texted Cowper and asked if he could send her a photo of the victim to confirm the identity. To distract the grief-stricken woman, Brown asked if she could take a quick look around her hotel room. Once inside, Mrs. Humboldt went directly to the bathroom and vomited. Abigail wasn't sure if it was from grief or alcohol. The woman reeked of booze. There were two wine bottles on the table, one empty, the other almost. The rest of the room was tidy with no signs of a struggle. The lack of luggage confirmed the couple's last-minute decision to spend the night. The detective found nothing suspicious in the room. When all was quiet in the bathroom, Brown asked the female cop who came with him to check on the woman. She considered Mrs. Humboldt as she exited the bathroom. She resembled the walking dead. Brown asked if there was anyone they could call, but the widow claimed she needed sleep and would take care of all that later. Mrs. Humboldt dropped onto the bed and passed out. Abigail returned to the crime scene before heading back to the office. The black curtain of night had started its retreat. Layers of indigo and burnt orange heralded the new day. After being up all night, sunrise was difficult to manage. Gravity worked at her eyelids. Since she had paperwork to complete, she stopped to grab a coffee. It would give her the jolt needed to finish the report before the lieutenant arrived for the day shift. The hot black liquid was a stinging reminder Abigail was still alive. Too bad Joel Humboldt couldn't say the same. 
Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.